Hello, Royster family. The Royster Community Food Pantry is a ministry dedicated to serving those in our community who are food insecure. They distribute food to their patrons on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 10 a.m., except for federal holidays. Most of the food distributed to the patrons is provided by the Food Bank of Southeastern Virginia and the Eastern Shore, but the need for additional items remains. That is where you are asked to make a difference. The Royster Community Food Pantry is asking for donations of cream of chicken soup, mushroom soup, bar soap, paper or plastic bags, and toilet paper. These items can be left on the table outside Monroe Chapel. Of course, monetary donations are always welcomed. The Royster Crafters Club continues to meet on the second and fourth Thursday of each month. The crafters meet in the church parlor at 5.30 p.m. If you like to quilt, crochet, draw, or just want to learn, come and join the Crafters Club for fun and fellowship. All crafts are welcome. Hello, Royster. Arthur here with an important announcement regarding the Old Testament Bible study. The Old Testament Bible study is pausing their Wednesday study of the Bible until after Easter. We do apologize for the inconvenience this may cause, but rest assured, we will return after Easter on the first and third Wednesday of each month to continue our study of the Old Testament. Are you in need of prayer? For yourself? For someone you know? Are you feeling that tug to pray? You are in luck. The Royster Prayer Group meets on the first and third Tuesday of each month. The meetings start at 5.30 p.m. in the John Monroe Chapel. Our prayer meetings are open to everyone. Please join us as we become a praying church. Hello all, Ava here. Did you know that the Sunday morning book study class has identified the next book they are going to dive into? Yes, they did. And the book is called How the Bible Actually Works by Peter Enns. They will begin this study on Sunday, April 7th at 10 a.m. in the John Monroe Chapel and will continue for 14 weeks. They will study a different chapter each week. The Royster Presbyterian women have formed their circles. The circles meet on the second Tuesday of each month. The afternoon circle meets at 1 p.m. The evening circle meets at 5.30 p.m. All women of Royster are invited. Contact Jill Kiefer for more information regarding the afternoon circle and Anna Wachter for the evening circle. Greetings, Royster family. Kelvin, one of your Royster avatars, here again. We have entered the Lenten season. This important time in our faith journey comes a very busy church schedule. The fifth Sunday of Lent is March 17th. On Sunday, March 24th, we will celebrate Palm Sunday, marking the first day of Holy Week. Then on Thursday, March 28th, we will observe the Maundy Thursday service. On Friday, March 29th, we have been invited by our brothers and sisters at Third Presbyterian Church to join them for a Good Friday service. On Easter Sunday, March 31st, we will have two services. There will be an Easter sunrise service in the John Monroe Chapel at 6.30 a.m. It will be followed by a more traditional Easter service at 11 a.m. in the sanctuary. We look forward to seeing you at these upcoming services. And never forget, Royster is a place where everyone is welcomed, even me.
Hillbilly that did my mother in law's funeral back in the day. I knew the end of the wages of sin was dead. She's there because she was a My mother, my wife has never gotten over that. It was not good. Free little Baptist in the hills. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> we are in the midst of Holy Week, believe it or not. We've got Palm Sunday today. Uh, we have got a great Maundy Thursday service coming up with a potluck that begins at 6.30. So we will be down in the fellowship hall at 6.30. <coughs> we will be in here at 7.30. So come on out. It's going to be some great music. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful, meaningful service, so I hope, I hope you can join us. And then we have got a special thing happening on Good Friday at uh, Third Presbyterian. We are gathering with our friends at Third and First United will also be there, and rumor is Calvin Presbyterian may show up. And as God would have it, as my good friend Veronica says, Third Presbyterian was scheduled to bring a lasagna dinner for the Nest folks, the homeless folks that we were housing. And when we canceled it, they had a whole bunch of kits that they had distributed to people to make lasagna. So at six o'clock on Friday, they are hosting a lasagna dinner. So we don't have to bring anything. It is not potluck. Just come on out and have a lasagna dinner and uh, enjoy Good Friday service at seven o'clock. So that I am looking forward to. Ought to be a good time. And then we've got an Easter sunrise service for the gathering. We will be starting it at 6.30 in the morning. It will be in the inside in the Monroe Chapel. This early in the year, we're not going to try to go outside. But if you feel like coming to a Mond uh, early service, come on out. And those are going to be some exciting times. I don't think a celebration of what Jesus went through would be complete without a session meeting. So we're going to have a session meeting on Tuesday as well. <laughs> so those of you who are elders, uh, 
invite your reports into Jill and be ready for the session meeting. Uh, the following week, I am on vacation. So starting Monday, I will be on vacation and Reverend Goodbow will be, will be preaching and officiating communion. So that'll be on the 7th. And now we have a distinguished guest that we haven't had amongst us for a while. Jill, you wanna come on up and make your announcement? <laughs> Can't hear you all. Okay, today's your last day to order lilies. Um, the order will go in and we will have these for next Sunday. So if you want a lily, they're in your bulletin. Um, one great hour of sharing is one of our missions that we support during the year. Um, they're envelopes for that. They should be either in the or in your bulletin today and next and Easter Sunday. And we already, uh, if we do have lilies and you don't want to take your lily home, we're going to ask one of our members who loves to do gardening outside, if you would create a lily garden right outside the door where the blue, li uh, blue awning is. There's already some lilies coming up there, so he can plant those lilies that you might not want to take home with you. And yes, session is. And on that happy note, do you have an announcement? All right. I just want to say um, thank you very much to Penny and Josh. They've been helping me with the coffee area because sometimes I'm running a bit late. And I also want to say thank you to everyone that's brought in things to use and also made donations. Thank you. There's a whole bunch of new flavors for tea in this decaf. All right, beautiful. And on that note, we come into the presence of the Lord God. Let us lift up our hearts and worship the Lord. All glory, love, and honor to thee, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet Hosanna's ring. Thou art the King of Israel, thou David's royal son, who in the Lord's names cometh the King and blessed one. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for the morning service. Then they brought the coat to Jesus. 
and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. You may be seated. As we watch the gate open for Jesus' triumphant entry, let us open the gates of our own hearts that we may confess with all honesty the sin that resides within us. Eternal God of mercy, hear us as we confess our sin. Daily we awaken to the new life you give us, yet we fall to quick. Moments await our decision to serve, yet time passes as we think. Our routine affords the chance The day is soon past. Forgive us for casting aside the precious time you give us each day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're entering a period of Lenten discipline. 
As such, there will be no assurance of pardon until Monday, Thursday, at which time participation in Christ's passion shows us the cost of our forgiveness, a price God was willing to pay out of great divine love for us and our salvation. You may be seated. Let us pray. Holy God, word made flesh, let us come to this word open to being surprised. Silence our agendas. Banish our assumptions. Cast out our casual detachment. Confound our expectations. Clear the cobwebs from our ears. Penetrate the corners of our hearts with this word. We know that you can. We pray that you will. And we wait with great anticipation. Amen. The New Testament readings are as printed in your bulletin. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival or there may be a riot among the people. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives and Jesus said to them, you will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. 
yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priestess came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, you also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I don't know or understand what you're talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. Then the cook crowded. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. Then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are Galilean. But he began to curse. And he swore an oath. I do not know this man, this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. He broke down and wept. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to this custom. Then he answered them, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. The grass withers and the flower fades. The word of our God stands forever. Let us pray. Holy God, we come again to your ancient word, seeking the inspiration of your living word. May your living word move in, through, and even in spite of the words of my mouth. In Jesus' name, amen. Theologian Scott Bader say, says, I used to think that the angels in the Bible began their messages with, do not be afraid because their appearance was so frightening. But I have come to think differently, he says. I suspect that they begin this way because quieting, the quieting of fear is required in order to hear and do what God asks of us. Fear makes it difficult to embrace the vulnerability involved in discipleship. It tempts us to replace Jesus' ethic of risk with an ethic of security. In the end, following Jesus requires that we step out into faith's daring. Courage, he says, is the capacity to do what is right and good in the face of fear. We become courageous when we learn to live for something that is more important 
than our own safety. The readings that we've selected for this Passion Sunday are a litany of people who did not learn to live for something more important than their own safety. Fear runs through this entire set of scriptures. In the first one, the chief priests and the scribes have always been afraid of Jesus because he's teaching something other than what they want. These people who have devoted their lives to God are afraid, and so they are not willing to live for something greater than themselves. They're not willing to live for that God that they have devoted their lives to if it means they are not safe. But they're also not willing to challenge what they think is blasphemous if that's not safe. They're afraid that there may be a riot among the people. They're afraid of the crowds. They're afraid of what Pilate's response would be. There is fear all through their response. And so they lack the courage to do what is right. Skipping down to that Mark 14, 66 through 72, Peter having just said that no matter what happened, even if it means his death, he would never deny Jesus. He wants to live into what Bader say, says. He wants that ethic, but he is afraid. And in his fear, he does exactly what he said he wouldn't. He's scared. You get to the pilot reading. And the crowds that were cheering Hosanna, Hosanna at the beginning of our service have begun to, to chant crucify, crucify as they realize the person they wanted to save them has been arrested and is in mortal danger. And God help us if that is us. And so they turn. They don't want to be identified as somebody who resisted. They don't want the same fate that Jesus is facing, and they are afraid. And the chief priests and the Romans are asking them to do something. And so against their own wishes, out of fear, against their own interests, out of fear, they say, crucify, crucify. Even Pilate is afraid. Pilate is afraid that the crowd won't be satisfied. If the crowd's not satisfied, they may riot. If they riot, those above him in the Roman hierarchy will come down on him. He is afraid, and so he does what has to be done. Not necessarily what he wants to do, but what has to be done. Fear runs through the entirety of these readings. And it makes people do things that they don't want to do. It makes them become somebody they don't want to be. It makes them turn their, it makes them turn their backs on the things that they've always said they believed because they are afraid. The contrast is in that middle reading where Jesus is obviously, he says, deeply grieved. How could you not be? It's not just death, but everything that he will go through to get to death. How could that not scare you? How could that level of violence and hate that you are going to endure not scare you. And yet, there is the courage to live for something that is more important than his own safety. Right there it is. He is the only one in this entire page of readings that does not act out of fear. And that fear continues. 
We're in the midst of the Passion, and it may be untoward to skip ahead to Easter, but we're going to because we're in Mark. And I want to read you the last two verses in Mark. 16, chapter 16, verse 7. But go tell his disciples and Peter, this is the angel speaking to the women, that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They said nothing to anyone. Even God saying Jesus has been raised from the dead, go and tell, doesn't quiet the fear. There is fear. There is terror. And it makes them quiet. Except it doesn't. Right? We wouldn't be here. Somebody had to get the courage to say something. Somebody had to speak. Peter say, says, courage requires community, both for the learning of courage and the living of it. And this community is not just of the present, but all those who have gone before us. Developing the virtue of courage requires not only this community that embodies and remembers courage, but a, courage, a community in which our fears can be given voice. And I think he hits it right there. A community in which our fears can be given voice. We come together. We are a church because we all have the same fears. But until we name them, they own us. Until we find ourselves in the midst of the community and somebody can say what scares them, it holds us all. Anne Lamott says, the first words of salvation are me too. And I think that's what happens here. At some point, these women are walking away. And I don't know if it took 100 yards. I don't know if it took 100 days. But at some point, one of them turns to the others and says, that scared me. Me too. I'm afraid to go tell Peter and the others about what we saw. Me too. I'm afraid to go to Galilee. Me too. You can almost feel it as I speak it, can't you? That there's this lifting of that fear. And all of a sudden, these women are no longer standing alone in their fear. But they're saying to each other, me too. And out of that comes the courage to tell somebody, because Mark wouldn't have written it if we hadn't told somebody. It comes from that community that gathers, not just in hope, but in the willingness to say to each other, I am afraid. I am afraid of dying. I may not be afraid of what comes next, I believe, but I am afraid of what I will face to get there. I am afraid of my wife dying and leaving me alone. I am afraid of democracy dying. I am afraid of my church dying. I am afraid. Me too. Me too. Goes a long way. I think Anne Lamont is right. It's the beginning of salvation, that me too. Courage doesn't just spring. The Bible never tells us about superheroes. 
The Bible tells us about communities that gather together and together work to bring about God's kingdom. The Bible tells us about families, about churches. It is always in those communities that are willing to love each other and to hear each other's I am afraid. And that becomes especially potent in a community like ours where we are so different from each other in so many ways that sometimes it can feel like the things one person fears are not even understood by another. And yet at the core of it, there is all of the, we fear death, we fear safety, we fear violence, we fear poverty, we fear hate. I am afraid of those things, me too, me too. In a perverse way, what unites all of humanity, what unites most of the people in these readings is a fear of what is happening that is beyond their control. But what God is telling us in this is that's not the final answer. What really unites us is the hope that Jesus Christ provides. What really unites us is a community that says, me too, and helps us stand against those fears. This is what is happening, not only on Easter, but on Pentecost. A group of people are coming together bound not just by their fears. They were gathered in the room afraid of the Jews. They were not just bound by their fears, but by the me too of I saw the flames above my head. The me too of I have experienced this God who was dead and now has been raised. The me too of I do not fear what happens beyond the grave. The me too of I have a community that will love my wife if I die first and love me if she goes. The first words of salvation are me too. In Jesus' name, let us be a me too congregation. Amen and amen. Let us stand as we recite the affirmation of faith. And it's also on page 14 of the blue hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
And we thank you and we honor you and we bring to you a token of what you have given us that you might know how deeply we want to trust you and have the courage to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We got a prayer. We got one prayer. Thank you. Right? It hasn't been in the bulletin for a bit, and she and we've been doing the Lord's Prayer down there, so. But you know what? This one we need to pray. So let us pray. Holy God, Almighty God. Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, Lord. We are your people who have been gathered. And we fear. We are human, Lord, so we fear. Look into our hearts. Look deep within who we are and see our fear. We lay it before you, before your cross. Look into the hearts of those you have gathered in our community. You know where there is a me too. For every fear in this room, there is a me too. Lord, put a fist in our back and cause us to reach out to each other. To name the fear, to share the fear that we might experience the courage that comes when two or three are gathered in your name. That comes with the me too. Lord, we gather on this day preparing to walk the Holy Week walk. And when we survey the wondrous cross, help us to see the me too. For every time we say, I am afraid of losing someone I love, God the Father says, me too. Every time we say, I dread my own death, my own passing from this life, God, the crucified Son, says, me too. And every time the church proclaims he has been raised, on the third day he was raised again, we say, me too as death was not the final answer. For Jesus, our Lord and Savior, neither shall it be for us. But we have a God who will join us when we are afraid, who will stand with us when we feel forsaken, who does not turn his back when we fear and tremble, but says, me too, come I will give you rest. Lord, make of us a community, a community where fears can be spoken and where courage can be nurtured, where faith walks behind you as discipleship. Build this community, Lord, sustain it. You are our God, and we are all your people. We know that you are the God who loves us like a mother. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is a fearsome world, there is no doubt. But God has gifted us with this community, formed by his spirit and gathered around his son, that we might have courage. Not through fear denied, but through fear shared and faith shared. Go now into this world, knowing that God's love and this community are stronger than the fear of this world. And may the Lord remain between me and thee while we are apart each from the other. Amen. 